A very warm welcome to everybody tonight. Uh, welcome along to this uh, revision blast for A level geography. I say welcome. I'm having a look at our YouTube stream here, and we've got quite a large number of you out there watching us tonight. So uh, I'm assuming that many of you are here for the very first time. If you are, brilliant, well done. It's lovely to see you. We've got 30 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer than that, of fast paced activities aimed at giving you some uh, revision uh, on water and carbon cycles. Now, just before we go on, on to tonight Let's, let me give you a little bit more information about some of the stuff we've got available from tutor to you as well just have a look at this here we also have available to you our on-demand online course for called grade booster 2023 for aqa a level geography uh, really useful uh, course for you if you've not seen it before 36 or so videos and other pieces of information that you find useful for your a level and i know that's just around the corner so hopefully that's of some benefit and use to you if you if you find that valuable right okay so uh it's not me tonight so much it is our two very uh, able and capable geographers we've got Catherine in the middle of the screen and alice on the right hand side good evening both hello hi are you both ready and shall we get cracking that'd be absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. john let's make a start yeah. let's go yeah. for it Brilliant. OK, thank you. So as John said, welcome to our revision blast. This is the first of two helping you to revise and recap for paper one topics ahead of your exam on the 17th of May, which, of course, is next week. We'll be taking a look at uh, section A initially. Let's just have a look at that today. So we're focusing on the water and the carbon cycles today. But first, I just want to go through a little bit of an overview of paper one and how does that work? OK, so the first section, as I say, is water and carbon cycles, and that looks very similar in the way it's laid out to section B, which is, of course, your landscape systems option. Some of us will have done hot deserts. 
Some of us will have done glacial systems, but most of us have probably done coasts for this. Now, within that for those first two sections, you've, your first question is going to be a four mark question, and that's an, a knowledge recall question, likely to be an outline or an explain question. Then we move on to two six mark questions. Now we need to look at those carefully because there are two different types of question there. The first six mark question based on previous exams is likely to be your AO3 skills question. And you can tell this because the question will be something like analyze the data, looking at some figures or evaluate the usefulness of these figures in understanding a topic. And then that second six mark, six mark question, sorry, is quite different. And you can look at some uh, related figures and start to explain the causes and the consequences. The clue to that question is it'll be saying, use this figure and your own knowledge. So look out for that phrase. And then you'll have a, uh, a single 20 mark question, which is, of course, our essay question. And that essay question, remember, has an all important requirement for a really uh, significant conclusion using the terminology in the question. And of course, your conclusion should, should logically flow from the rest of what you've written. But what happens after sections A and B, John? OK, so section C, you'll be answering questions on hazards or ecosystems under stress. Just to point out that the layout of this section is slightly different. So we start with that one four mark uh, knowledge recall question again, uh, explain or outline. Then you've got your skills question, which will be, as we think, analyze the data or perhaps evaluate the usefulness of some figures. And then we have two nine mark questions. Now, they don't necessarily have figures with them. They will require a concluding statement rather than perhaps a paragraph. But don't worry about an introduction. You probably haven't got time for that with your nine markers. And then you've got your 20 mark question, which is very much like uh, the, the extended answer question that you'll have answered in sections A and B. So, of course, we've got 120 marks uh, over two and a half hours. So estimating at about a minute and a quarter per mark. So that just gives you a little reminder of how paper one works. OK, but. Enough of that, I think, John. Let's look at an activity. And our first activity here is all about popping the, popping the bubbles. And the topic is list as many components of the carbon cycle as you can. So if you're playing with us live, and many of you are, what I'd like you to do is maybe type three different components. So I'm thinking about inputs, outputs, stores, and flows of the carbon cycle into the chat. OK, so three components of the carbon cycle into the chat and then we'll see how many that you've typed in that link to our bubbles that we're going to pop in a second. So if you think, say, respiration is a process, a flow or a transfer within the carbon cycle, you might put respiration down as your first process. OK, we've got some really good ideas coming into the chat now straight away. Combustion, we've got decomposition, we have photosynthesis seems to be a popular one. Lots of good ideas about stores as well. We've got the lithosphere as a store. I don't like to give away too many others, but yeah, thank you for those people who are contributing in the chat. Of course, if you're watching us on catch up, you can play on a bit of paper in front of you. How many different elements of the carbon cycle can you list down? Some really good ideas coming through. Right, John, shall we start to pop our bubbles to revise, reveal Sorry, what we had on our slide? So we had atmosphere. Next one, we had organic matter. So we had two different stores there, the biomass, two different stores within the carbon cycle. What's the next one, John? We had ocean sediments. OK, another important store. And we had photosynthesis, a key process, a process associated with carbon sequestration, of course. Next up, we have combustion. So the idea that uh, wildfires are releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And we had oceans, ocean being a really important store of carbon and removing carbon from the atmosphere. And then we had respiration. I think we've got just one more, John. Is that right? Yeah. Lastly, we have decomposition. Now, clearly, there are a lot more than eight different elements. Uh, inputs, outputs, stores and flows within the global carbon cycle. But thank you to everyone who's contributed. 
Brilliant. Over to you, Catherine. Right. Absolutely fantastic. Well done for everyone that's contributing. We have got so many ideas coming up and that's lovely because um, you're all supporting each other, which is really important with a week to go to the exam. So fantastic stuff. And what we're looking at here is um, the importance of taking a systems approach. So throughout the specifications that you're using, I've noticed some people have said you're um, from a background of OCR and Excel. The content is core um, across for this topic across the different specifications. So don't worry, it'll be fine. And taking a systems approach is really important when we're looking at many of the different topics that come up in A-level geography and thinking about how those systems are broken down into stores, flows and transfers. And of course, we've got the open systems which have inputs and outputs of matter, whereas you close systems, you've got the matter that's going round and round and round and round and round in the cycle, and um, the input is going to be in terms of energy. So we're gonna be thinking, first of all, a little bit about this systems approach. So we're looking here particularly at water and carbon cycles, both of which are closed systems. You need to make sure you know how the water and the carbon cycles operate, but also you need to understand how they are interrelated. And this is not just important for passing your exam. That would be lovely. Um, but we need to understand how these systems work if we can understand the cri climate crisis. And that is gonna be important to you in your lives beyond those exams. You're gonna be going off there into the world and whatever walk of life you end up in, we are gonna be finding there's more and more connections with the climate crisis. So key thing to understand is this idea of feedback. And this often tricks people because when we're talking about positive feedback, it is not a good thing. So you think, yay, positive. Um, that's going to be something good. That is not the case with positive feedback when we're thinking about the carbon cycle. When we're thinking about positive feedback, we're thinking about the system moving away from equilibrium. And then we're thinking about consequences of that, meaning that it keeps moving further and further away from equilibrium. So you can see the little picture there of a spiral. So it's starting to move away from the center, the equilibrium, and it's moving further and further away. So this can happen sometimes in the carbon cycle when we're looking at um, changes like having the um, carbon levels in the atmosphere going up because maybe of the enhanced greenhouse effect. So that means that temperatures are going to increase. So then ice is melting in areas where there's permafrost. Lakes are getting uncovered and the methane from these lakes is rising up into the atmosphere, which is bringing more carbon into the atmosphere, which leads to more enhanced greenhouse effect and more warming and more permafrost melting. And you can see how that is going to lead to things spiraling out of control. Negative feedback is something which sees a change move the system away from the equilibrium, but then it moves back again. And so it, things rebalance. So we've got the picture of the scales there, the rebalancing. And what is really important with understanding these feedback loops is not just knowing about them in terms of theory, but also being able to apply them. When we're thinking about things like um, mitigating cl climate change, if you understand positive feedback, you can see why temperatures are spiraling. If you understand negative feedback, you can think of mitigation strategies which are going to bring the carbon back into balance again. Things like um, planting trees, which are going to then be acting as carbon sinks, which are then going to mean that equilibrium can be um, restored again. So really important that we understand the carbon cycle as a system with its different components and we understand these concepts of positive and negative feedback. So time for a little game. Um, just warming up your brains a little bit, thinking about major stores of water. So we have on the screen here, um, lithosphere. And what we're going to be thinking about in a moment is you're going to see how much of our global water stores are in the lithosphere. 
then we're going to reveal oh there we go so 1.1 percent of water is in the lithosphere so we are now going to see another sphere revealed and you need to type into the chat do you think there is going to be more or less water in the atmosphere than in the lithosphere so are we going higher or are we going lower right okay so lots of people started off saying higher and then lower and oh wow there's so many going by let's have a little look at what the answer is okay so um we've got a tiny amount of water in the atmosphere so when we're looking at our stores of water only a tiny amount of the global um, water budget is going to be in the atmosphere so what is our next sphere we're going to look at cryosphere so cryosphere is the world of ice thinking about glaciers thinking about ice caps so is that going to be higher or lower yeah you guys are too too good aren't you everyone's going higher on this one so let's see how much is in the cryosphere so we've got 1.9 percent of the water is in the cryosphere so what is our last sphere that we've got here right so the hydrosphere so what do you reckon so yeah much higher yeah so let's see our figure for the hydrosphere there yeah, so much, much higher. Well done, those of you that were thinking, yeah, that's going to be much, much higher. So what we need to be thinking about um, when we're thinking about water is that actually um, we've got huge amounts in the hydrosphere, as you'd expect. We've got most of our water in the oceans, which is salty, of course. We then have some of the water in the cryosphere, which is um, going to be locked up in ice. So we've only actually got quite small stores of water that are easily available for people to be able to use so the water stores um they will change in magnitude magnitude is a good way to say size it is worth using vocabulary like saying magnitude because it's going to come across a lot better to your examiner if you're using that terminology. So think all the time when you're doing practice questions in the run up to um, the exam next week, be thinking all the time, are you using these really good words to get the marks? And the amount of water is going to vary in different stores over time um, because there are going to be changes in flows. And the flows we're looking at with the uh, water cycle here, we're thinking about evaporation, condensation, cloud formation. We're thinking about precipitation in different forms and cryospheric processes. And one of the things to be really careful with when you're revising is think about scale. You could get questions asking you to just consider a hill slope. Just think about the precipitation falling on a hill slope and where's that water going next? You might be thinking about a drainage basin and you might be thinking about the whole world. So global scales. So I'm going to hand it over now to Alice to recap some of what we've just looked at. It was a bit of true and false. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got some statements here about processes, I believe, in the water cycle. And you've got to work out whether this statement is true or false. We're just going to give you a little minute to have a look at it and read it. And then I'd need your answers in the chat, please, if you're live. Otherwise, play along at home. Uh, precipitation can be caused by convectional, oreographic and frontal processes. So lots of good geography terminology there, as Catherine was suggesting. Good to use in your answers. I'll read that again. Precipitation can be caused by convectional, oreographic and frontal processes. Is that true or false? Got quite a few people saying true. John, can we see the answer? Absolutely right. So that is true. And it's important to understand what causes variation in processes of condensation and precipitation at a global scale. You'll have studied the tricellular atmospheric model, no doubt, um, and that'll stand you in good stead. But just having some idea of the way that precipitation is created. Thank you, next one. So true or false, ablation leads to glaciers advancing and so a reduction in meltwater. I'll read that one again, true or false. Ablation leads to glaciers advancing and so a reduction in meltwater. What do you think? 
obviously easier for those of us that are doing glacial systems and landscapes, but we should all be able to have a go because we need to understand some basics of processes in the cryosphere. Quite a few people not agreeing with this one. Let's have a look at the answer. So this one is false. Of course, ablation is the uh, key geography term for the melting or the loss of mass of glaciers, uh, which might take place, for example, in the spring. And it certainly wouldn't lead to glaciers advancing, more likely lead to retreat up within the valley. As I say, loss of, of, of uh, mass of the glacier and certainly uh, changing of all that ice into meltwater. So well done, people got that one right. Next up, we have this statement. Clouds form when water droplets coalesce around condensation nuclei. I'll read that one again. Clouds form when water droplets coalesce around condensation nuclei. What do you think? I can see the first 10 or so answers are true for this one. John, are they right? Yes, absolutely, they are right. So condensation, often the precursor to precipitation or required for precipitation, requires some form of nuclei for the water vapor to condense onto and coalesce around. So that's really important. And again, thinking about this key terminology we're using here. OK, and then we have our fourth true or false. Latent heat is released into the atmosphere when water turns from a gas to liquid form. Latent heat is released into the atmosphere when water turns from a gas to liquid form. Does that sound right to you? Now in the chat, quite a few people think that is correct. So John, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. The answer is that is true. So latent meaning hidden heat energy is released when water returns from a vapour to a liquid form. Remember to, to, to go the other way, you might takes lots of energy. So thinking about having to plug in your kettle in order to get it to steam. So when it goes the other way, when it becomes um, a liquid, we get this release of heat energy. And of course, this powers the uplift within storm clouds and fuels the development of hurricanes or tropical storms, thinking about linking to that hazards topic. And then we have this last one, this last true or false, changes in evaporation rates are solely caused by changes in solar energy. Changes in evaporation rates are solely caused by changes in solar energy. What do you think? Sounds a bit dubious to me, John. Can you reveal the answer? Yeah, and of course that one is false. So if we think about changes within, for example, a rainforest environment that you might have studied, clearly, clearance of vegetation, felling of trees, can reduce interception, which in turn will reduce the evaporation rate. So the water that was temporarily stored on the surface of leaves that gets re-evaporated, as well as reducing transpiration rates, all of that clearance or deforestation. So that one is false. What do we have next? Aha. Um, I don't know whether this is you or me, Catherine. This, I think is, it's this you. is me, I think. Yeah, back to Over me. To you. Um, <laughs> So we are looking now, um, we just looked at stores of water um, just now, and we're thinking now about stores of carbon. So um, almost all of carbon is in the lithosphere. That is in the form of sedimentary rocks. So you've got those ocean sediments that sink down to the bottom of the ocean and become compressed into those sedimentary rocks. Uh, we've got hydrocarbon, so your fossil fuels, your oil and your coal. You've got the marine sediments and you've got organic carbon. There are only tiny amounts of um, carbon in the hydrosphere, cryosphere, atmosphere and biosphere. And one of the things that is quite incredible to think about is that um, only 0.0015% of carbon is in the atmosphere. When we think about carbon in the atmosphere, sometimes you can almost imagine that there's like, you know, there's masses of it up there, but there's only a tiny amount of the global carbon in the atmosphere. However, when that changes, that has a massive impact. One thing to note, though, is there's only a tiny amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So when people are talking about carbon sequestration by taking carbon out of the atmosphere, that's actually quite hard 
because only a tiny amount of carbon is in the atmosphere. So it's really worth pondering that figure and thinking about the implications. So when we're thinking about changes in the carbon cycle, we've got natural um, variations that happen in the carbon cycle. And we also have variations related to human activities. And so we've got um, aspects like volcanic activity and wildfires. Um, the volcanic activity has been absolutely crucial in the geological timescales, looking back over how um, climate has changed um, because volcanic activity releases carbon and that carbon has been part of the long carbon cycle. So it takes a huge amount of time for the carbon that is in ocean sediments to then go into sedimentary rocks and then be melted down um, under the Earth's surface and then erupt out of a volcano again. The wildfires are part of a much more rapid carbon cycling and wildfires are something as well that we may consider to not be totally natural. Um, in many parts of the world nowadays, we have 90% um, of wildfires that have been caused by people. So if you have questions about natural variation in the carbon cycle, it can actually you know, be worth commenting about things like wildfires not being so natural anymore. So let's have a little look at some questions in relation to some of these points. This is a picture grid. So a question is going to come up and then you can jot down your thoughts on the answers into the chat and then we'll see if you've got it right. And eventually a picture will be revealed. So let's see the first question. So this question says these natural phenomena release carbon into the atmosphere and clear vegetation. So type into the chat box, what do you think there could be? The, we've just looked um, at the idea of natural phenomena. So what might release carbon, but also clear vegetation? Right, excellent. Yeah, so we've got there, um, we've got there lots of wildfires being put down there. A few people suggesting um, some other things as well, but mainly wildfires. Let's see if they're correct. Yeah, excellent. So let's see the first bit of the picture be revealed. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a photograph there being revealed. And then we've got another question. This is released when wetlands are drained for farming. So when we're thinking about human actions, which are going to affect the carbon cycle, we are not just thinking about burning fossil fuels, we're also thinking about other aspects of human activity, such as farming. So, right, let's see. So people are saying about methane being released. Right, okay, and are they getting it right? Let's see. Brilliant, yes. Yeah. So some of you were popping down carbon. Um, when we've got the wetlands being drained for farming, this is methane being released. And methane obviously has carbon in it. But one of the things about methane is it is a particularly powerful greenhouse gas. So um, even small quantities of it can have quite a major effect. OK, so let's see the next reveal and the next question. So it says hydrocarbons, which form when organic material is compressed under oceans, and release carbon dioxide when burnt. So what could we be thinking about there if we've got organic material being compressed under the oceans and then when you burn these, it releases carbon dioxide. So what could we, what might we call these hydrocarbons? Right, excellent. So we've got people saying about um, oil, fossil fuels coming up there. Yeah, excellent. Let's see the answer. Yep, so we got fossil fuels. So we got coal and oil, fossil fuels there um, that are being compressed under the oceans. And then when we burn those fossil fuels, we release that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Brilliant. OK, so um, the next question there, it says these erupt releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So that's a really easy one. You're going to be able to do that one so simply. Right. So brilliant. Oh, and yeah, someone said the image behind is a volcano as well. And that links in with this answer. All right. Excellent stuff. So, yeah, volcanoes um, erupt, releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And if we release another click off that piece. Yeah. So we are looking here at um, Kilauea 
in Hawaii is the volcano that is in the picture there. So our next question, it says carbon dioxide is released due to the thermal decomposition of calcium carbonate needed to make this building material. So this is something that actually contributes a lot of um, carbon into the atmosphere, but a lot of people forget about it. So what building material could it be that's contributing a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? Right, excellent, right, brilliant, yeah. Got lots of people saying concrete, let's see if that's correct. Right, so yeah, cement, concrete, um, we are looking there at when we're building using those materials, large amounts of carbon dioxide are going to be released. And so sometimes you hear um, people talking about places like, for example, Hinkley Point C. I live very near where the new nuclear power station is being built. And they're saying about how it's going to be carbon neutral. But I asked them a question about how long is that going to take? Because they've used huge amounts of cement and concrete to build the power station. So that needs to be factored in as well. So, right, let's see our last question here. Right, okay, so um, so they release sulfur and dust into the atmosphere leading to temporary global cooling. So what could it be that's releasing sulfur and dust into the atmosphere, which can lead to temporary global cooling? Right, yeah, yeah, there's some people being very clever there, realizing this might be the same thing again. Let's see the answer. Right. Yeah. So volcanoes. So volcanoes are really interesting because in the short term, they are going to be um, erupting potentially things like sulfur and dust, which will go into the atmosphere and then block the sun's rays from getting um, down to the Earth's surface. So they could cause cooling. But in the long run, they could be releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which could then create warming. So it's one of those things where you have to have a little think. And we've already had some brilliant people before um, saying the image behind the grid there, that is Kilauea in Hawaii. So that is a, a volcano, an active volcano. Absolute brilliant stuff there. Well done. And over to Alice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Just a siren there reminding us that we have a case study here for water and carbon. We need to know the specifics about a named case study of a tropical rainforest. What do we need to know about it? We need to know about its water cycle, its carbon cycle and their relationship, those cycles to environmental change and, of course, human activity. So it doesn't matter which one you've studied, but you need to know some facts and figures about how uh, it is changing and how its cycles are changing. So consider at this late stage, boiling down what you now know into a simple cue card of a form, uh, maybe with six, eight, 10 killer facts that might be useful, kind of whatever the question, thinking about some facts relating to the water cycle, some facts relating to the carbon cycle. I don't know whether Catherine agrees with me, but I think that's probably the stage we're at now in terms of the end game. Right, okay, so let's have a look at the next activity. It's called Chains of Analysis, and it links to change in the Brazilian Amazon. So you here you've got to rearrange the sentences uh, to form a chain of analysis. Now there's quite a lot to read here, so we'll give you a chance to read that. But what I need you to do if you're watching live in the chat is type those five numbers in the order that you think those sentences would knit together as a kind of analytical paragraph. So quite a lot to read there. Just have a little read through that. And of course, if you're playing at home on catch up, you can pause the video here and read really carefully and work out what's what. But as I say, my hint is about change in the carbon cycle in the Brazilian Amazon. So what do you think might we be starting that paragraph with? So if you think you're starting with statement three, what follows after statement three? Good. We've got a few people having a go in the chat, some various answers. John, can you reveal the answer? And then I'm going to talk through the correct answer for that paragraph then. So the Amazon rainforest plays a vital role in the transfer of carbon from the atmosphere to the biosphere. So you needed three first, then five. However, the amount of carbon dioxide absorbed by the Amazon rainforest in the 1990s was 30% higher than today. 
after that we had four. So deforestation has reduced the forest's, forest's ability to sequester carbon. Farming has led to trees being cleared to make room for cattle ranches and soybean plantations. Then it's statement two, Brazil has taken steps to tackle the climate crisis by cutting its carbon dioxide emissions and slowing down deforestation with rates from almost 20,000 square kilometres in the 1990s to just over 5,000 square kilometres today. And then we've got statement one, which was next steps uh, for Brazil are to tackle illegal deforestation. It is hoped that these successes will prompt other nations to protect their share of the Amazon rainforest. So that's a really nice analytical argument we've put across there, kind of outlining what's going on in the rainforest and what's going in, on in particular in terms of rate of carbon sequestration. Thank you. Oh, and we've got that second case study, of course, with water and carbon. So not to forget that. So you do need a case study of a river catchment at a local scale, note that local scale. So what do you need to know about it? Well, we're particularly interested in looking at stores and transfers within it and the implications of those for sustainable water supply or, for example, flooding. So the idea of the hazard that might be created by uh, variation in the impact of precipitation. So not forgetting you've got that second case study again, which you need to think about boiling down. And I think our next activity links to uh, that water cycle. And if we think about if I say tell you the clue is this is all about factors affecting runoff. So our, our central topic is drainage basin stores and transfers. And if we spin the needle, John, to find out where it's going to rest, could land anywhere. Exciting. Aha. So we've got drainage basin stores and transfers. How does that link to geology? How does geology perhaps, uh, is that a factor in affecting the impact of precipitation and runoff? What do you think? Can you make a link between those two uh, elements of this water cycle topic? How might geology play a role in, for example, the variation of runoff? OK, so, yeah, absolutely. Geology does mean rock type, but we've got oh, we've got some ideas about permeability. What's our answer on this one, John? OK, so the permeability of rocks may change across the drainage basin, affecting infiltration rates and groundwater stores. And of course, the rate of infiltration or storage by groundwater will uh, reduce the rate of runoff. OK, let's spin the wheel again, please. Spin the needle. OK, so where's it going to land this time? So a different kind of factor that influences runoff variation over time or and space. Right, land use. So think about different land uses. How does that affect drainage basin stores and transfers? How does it affect how runoff varies over time and space? OK, we've got some good ideas coming in on the chat. Thank you for all your contributions. That's great. Oh, yes, of course. Agricultural land, that's going to affect transfers quite differently to, for example, urban areas. Well done. What was our answer to this one, John, in terms of the connection? Yeah, so rivers often start on upland moors, then flow through farmland, interspersed with settlements, each have different impacts on stores and transfer, transfers. So we've got different rates, different amounts of runoff there. OK, Catherine, can I hand over to you for this excellent uh, practice exam question? Absolutely. Um, so it is um, always a little bit nerve wracking to think about which questions are going to come up for your 20 markers. And um, so what you need to be thinking about with those 20 markers is making sure that you have got that thorough knowledge. So look at your specifications, whichever exam board you're working with. Look at the specification, make sure you know what all the words mean on it. And then you need to make sure you've got the understanding of the concepts and you have got examples and case studies to support your points. So this is a question that could come up on the AQA specification, but similar questions could come up um, as the 
extended questions for other specifications. So it says natural variations are much less significant than human impacts in changing the carbon cycle. To what extent do you agree with this statement in relation to a tropical rainforest you have studied? So if we break that question down a little bit, you can see that the first thing that I've lit up there um, is to what extent. So when we get these to what extent questions, you need to say, you know, basically how much do you agree with this? So do you agree to a large extent? Do you agree to some extent? Whatever you decide to do, you need to make sure you are just defining your points of view. And it is a good idea to make sure that you have got a really clear view on this. So um, if you say something which is really sitting on the fence, it can be much harder to be able to come up with that really good conclusion. So a nice, clear statement of what to, to what extent is a really good idea in your answer. So moving on then to look at the first bit of the question. So we know we're talking about to what extent do we agree with this statement, but what do we need to consider? So it's talking about natural variations. We already had a little look at um, natural variations. So thinking about things like wildfires and thinking about things like volcanic activity. And then it's saying are much less significant than human impacts. So thinking about human impacts with a carbon cycle, we've already looked at the idea of it not just being burning fossil fuels, but thinking about the impacts of things like agriculture, land use change, deforestation. And then we're looking at this in changing the carbon cycle. So the carbon cycle, the systems approach here is crucial. Thinking about how we've got these different stores, we've got these different flows and how those are affected by natural variations, how they're affected by human impacts. We need to be thinking about the systems approach underlying our thinking all the way through. And then finally, this is in the context to a tropical rainforest that you have studied. So if you're doing the AQA specification, you are looking at a tropical rainforest case study, you need to know those facts and figures. So you need to be able to talk about the natural variations and then think about it. Things like seasonal variations aren't going to be important in a tropical rainforest because they don't have um, seasons which are going to be much drier and much wetter or warmer or cooler. Tropical rainforest is on the equator and it doesn't have the same seasonal change that we do in areas like the UK. So you need to really be thinking about this in the context of the tropical rainforest, making sure that what you're talking about is relevant to the tropical rainforest and supported with the facts and figures that you have learnt when you have been revising for this exam. So 20 mark questions, really important to support those with the real world examples throughout. I've just been marking some work by my students. Hopefully some of them are on here today. Um, but um, when I was giving feedback today, I was saying to them, you know, the best answers are the ones where you have got the real world examples that are supporting the answer throughout. It is not good practice to be talking about something for a big paragraph and then at the end say, for example, in the Amazon, that is not going to do it. It's not going to get you those top marks. So the question we just looked at specifically required use of a case study. Sometimes you might need to use a range of examples, but supporting your answer with those real world examples is crucial to help you get those top marks. Thank you, Catherine. Some really good top tips there for those 20 markers. Um, those people who want a little bit more revision time on the water and the carbon cycle, we have a couple of revision blasts. So uh, if you're on YouTube or the Tutor2 website, you can find those because you've got the titles there. One is the water cycle and change over time and flood hydrographs. And then we've got another revision blast for you all about the carbon cycle feedbacks and mitigating climate change and they have got some work through practice answers as well so some more resources for you there of course 
Wow. What can I say? What can I say? Uh, I'll tell you what, the, the the level of responses tonight have been absolutely superb. Um, absolutely fantastic. I'm not sure we've seen that number of people responding to questions uh, for A-level geography before. So thank you to everybody who got involved. Uh, just a quick reminder, of course, the presentation we've been using tonight, it will be available for you to download as soon as we've finished this uh, live stream, which would be in just a few moments time. And of course, you can rewatch the whole thing again in your own time uh, and pause where you feel necessary. Massive thank you to Catherine and to Alice for a wonderful set of presentations there and uh, fantastic little activities for everybody to get involved in. If you've enjoyed tonight and you uh, feel as if it's been valuable, please please give us a thumbs up uh, in YouTube and that'll help other people to know us about us going forward. We've got another one coming up very soon. Alice, am I right? We absolutely have. It's on Thursday at the same time, 6.30. So Thursday, the 11th of May, and we'll be looking at the popular option topics. So we'll be looking at coastal systems and landscapes, and we'll be also dipping into hazards to help you out for paper one next week. Brilliant stuff. Well, let's hope we can see as many people who are here tonight watching us on Thursday as well. Until then, we'll say a goodbye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.